Chapter Eight of Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic by Thomas Higginson. Chapter Eight. Sir Lancelot of the Lake. Sir Lancelot, the famous knight, was the son of a king and queen against whom their subjects rebelled. The king was killed, the queen taken captive, when a fairy rose in a cloud of mist and carried away the infant Lancelot from where he had been left beneath a tree. The queen, after weeping on the body of her husband, looked round and saw a lady standing by the waterside holding the queen's child in her arms. Fair sweet friend, said the queen, give me back my child. The fairy made no reply, but dived into the water, and the queen was taken to an abbey, where she was known as the queen of great griefs. The lady of the lake took the child to her own home, which was an island in the middle of the sea, and surrounded by impassable walls. From this the lady had her name of Dame du Lac, or the lady of the lake, or sea and her foster son was called Lancelot du Lac, while the realm was called Midaland, or the Land of Maidens. Lancelot dwelt thenceforth in the castle on the island. When he was eight years old, he received a tutor, who was to instruct him in all knightly knowledge. He learned to use bow and spear, and to ride on horseback, and some cousins of his were also brought thither by the Lady of the Lake to be his comrades. When he was eighteen, he wished to go to King Arthur's court that he might be a knight. On the eve of St. John, as King Arthur returned from the chase, and by the high road approached Camelot, he met a fair company. In the van went two youths, leading two white mules, one freighted with a silken pavilion, the other with robes proper for a newly made knight. The mules bore two chests, holding the hauberk and the iron boots. Next came two squires clad in white robes and mounted on white horses, carrying a silver shield and a shining helmet. After these, two others, with a sword in a white sheath and a white charger. Behind followed squires and servants in white coats, three damsels dressed in white, the two sons of King Bors, and, last of all, the fairy with the youth she loved. Her robe was of white samite lined with ermine. Her white palfrey had a silver bit, while her breastplate, stirrups, and saddle were of ivory, carved with figures of ladies and knights, and her white housings trailed on the ground. When she perceived the king, she responded to his salutation, and said, after she had lowered her wimple and displayed her face, Sir, may God bless the king of kings. I come to implore a boon, which it shall cost you nothing to grant. Damsel! Even it should cost me, dear, you should not be refused. What is it you would have me do? Sir, dub this violet a knight, and array him in the arms he bringeth, whenever he desireth. Your mercy, damsel, to bring me such a youth, assuredly I will dub him whenever he will, but it shameth me to abandon my custom, for tis my want to furnish with garments and arms such as come thither to receive chivalry. The lady replied that she desired the youth to carry the arms she had intended him to wear, and if she were refused, she would address herself elsewhere. Sir so Ewan said that so fair a youth ought not to be denied, and the king yielded to her entreaty. She returned thanks and bade the varlet retain the mules and the charger, and the two squires, and after that she prepared to return as she had come, in spite of the urgency of the king who had begged her to remain in his court. At least, he cried, tell us by what name you are known. Sir, she answered, I am called the Lady of the Lake. For a long way, Lancelot escorted the fairy, who said to him as she took leave, King's son, you are derived from lineage the most noble on earth. See to it that your worth be as great as your beauty. Tomorrow you will ask the king to bestow on you knighthood. When you are armed, you will not tarry in his house a single night. Abide in one place no longer than you can help, 
and refrain from declaring your name until others proclaim it. Be prepared to accomplish every adventure, and never let another man complete a task which you yourself have undertaken. With that, she gave him a ring that had the property of dissolving enchantment, and commanded him to God. On the morrow, Lancelot arrayed himself in his fairest robes, and sued for knighthood, as he had been commanded to do. Sir Ewan attended him to court, where they dismounted in front of the palace. The king and queen advanced to meet them. Each took Sir Ewan by a hand and seated him on a couch, while the violets stood in the presence of the rushes that strewed the floor. All gazed with pleasure, and the queen prayed that God might make him noble, for he possessed as much beauty as was possible for man to have. After this he had many perilous adventures. He fought with giants and lions. He entered an enchanted castle and escaped. He went to a well in the forest and, striking three times on a cymbal with a hammer, hung there for the purpose, called forth a great giant, whom he slew, afterwards marrying his daughter. Then he went to rescue the queen of the realm, Guinevere, from captivity. In order to reach the fortress where she was prisoner, he had to ride in a cart with a dwarf to follow a wheel that rolled before him to show him the way, or a ball that took the place of the wheel. He had to walk on his hands and knees across a bridge made of a drawn sword. He suffered greatly. At last he rescued the queen, and later than this he married Elaine, the daughter of King Pelez, and her father gave to them the castle of Bliant in the joyous island, enclosed in iron and with a deep water all around it. There Lancelot challenged all knights to come and contend with him, and he jousted with more than five hundred, overcoming them all, yet killing none, and at last he returned to Camelot, the place of King Arthur's court. One day he was called from the court to an abbey, where three nuns brought to him a beautiful boy of fifteen, asking that he might be made a knight. This was Sir Lancelot's own son, Galahad, whom he had never seen, and did not yet know. That evening Sir Lancelot remained at the abbey with the boy, that he might keep his vigil there, and on the morrow's dawn he was made a knight. Sir Lancelot put on one of his spurs, and Bors, Lancelot's cousin, the other. And then Sir Lancelot said to the boy, Fair son, attend me to the court of the king. But the abbess said, Sir, not now, but we will send him when it shall be time. On Whit Sunday, at the time called Undern, which was nine in the morning, King Arthur and his knights sat at the round table, where on every seat there was written in letters of gold the name of a knight with, Here ought to sit he, or He ought to sit here. And thus went the inscriptions until they came to one seat, or siege in French, called the Siege Perilous, where they found newly written letters of gold, saying that this seat could not be occupied until four hundred and fifty years after the death of Christ, and that was this very day. Then came news of a marvellous stone, which had been seen above the water, with a sword sticking in it, bearing the letters, Never shall man take me hence, but only he by whose side I ought to hang, and he shall be the best knight of the world. Then two of the knights tried to draw the sword, and failed to draw it. And Sir Lancelot, who was thought the best knight in all the world, refused to attempt it. Then they went back to their seats around the table. Then when all the seats but the siege perilous were full, the hall was suddenly darkened, and an old man clad in white, whom nobody knew, came in, with a young knight in red armour, wearing an empty scabbard at his side, who said, Peace be with you, fair knights. The old man said, I bring you here, a young knight that is of king's lineage. And the king said, Sir, ye are right heartily welcome. Then the old man bade the young knight to remove his armour, and he wore a red garment, while the old man placed on his shoulders a mantle of fine ermine, and said, Sir, follow after. Then the old man led him to the siege perilous, next to Sir Lancelot, and lifted the cloth and read, Here sits Sir Galahad and the youth sat down. Upon this all the knights of the round table marvelled greatly at Sir Galahad, that he dared to sit in that seat, and he so tender of age. 
Then King Arthur took him by the hand and led him down to the river to see the adventure of the stone. Sir, said the king to Sir Galahad, here is a great marvel, where right good knights have tried and failed. Sir, said Sir Galahad, that is no marvel, for the adventure was not theirs, but mine. I have brought no sword with me, for here by my side hangs the scabbard. And he laid his hand on the sword and lightly drew it from the stone. It was not until long after, when they both had had many adventures, that Sir Lancelot discovered Galahad to be his son. Sir Lancelot once came to the sea strand, and found a ship without sails or oars, and sailed away upon it. Once, when he touched at an island, a young knight came on board, to whom Lancelot said, Sir, you are welcome. And when the young knight asked his name, told him, My name is Sir Lancelot de Lac. Sir, he said, then you are welcome, for you are my father. Ah, said Lancelot, are you Sir Galahad? Then the young knight kneeled down and asked his blessing, and they embraced each other, and there was great joy between them, and they told each other all their deeds. So dwelt Sir Lancelot and Sir Galahad together, within that ship for half a year, and often they arrived at islands far from men, where there were but wild beasts, and they found many adventures strange and perilous, which they brought to an end. When Sir Lancelot at last died, his body was taken to Joyous Guard, his home, and there it lay in state in the choir, with a hundred torches blazing above it, and while it was there came his brother, Sir Ector de Maris, who had long been seeking Lancelot. When he heard such noise and saw such lights in the choir, he alighted and came in, and Sir Bors went towards him and told him that his brother Lancelot was lying dead. Then Sir Ector threw his shield and sword and helm from him, and when he looked on Sir Lancelot's face, he fell down in a swoon, and when he rose he spoke thus, Ah, Sir Lancelot, said he, thou art dead of all Christian knights, and now I dare say that Sir Lancelot, there thou liest, thou art never matched of none earthly knight's hands, and thou wert the courteous knight that ever bare shield. And thou wert the truest friend to thy lover that ever bestrewed horse, and thou wert the truest lover of a sinful man that ever loved woman, and thou wert the kindest man that ever struck with sword, and thou wert the goodliest person that ever came among press of knights, and thou wert the meekest man and the gentlest that ever eat in hall among ladies, and thou wert the sternest knight of thy mortal foe that ever put spear in the rest. End of chapter 8